All right. That'll work. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, again, setup's a little different in here, of course, because um, as some we were talking about a little bit before, there is a, um, we have, the quilters have the bazaar in here. So they were all quilting this morning, and they um, tomorrow they're going to come in and totally rearrange the room. And so this, these tables are already set up for the quilters, and they just moved these, these back to over just so we would have some space tonight rather than putting everything back and then redoing it all tomorrow. So, yeah. So um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and, and kind of jump into a couple of things. Um, there's a lot of things I want to talk about. Not a lot. There's two things I want to talk about tonight. Um, one is, a, is a, um, a carryover from last week when we were talking about prayer. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the relationship of prayer and worship. <clears throat> um, because there is a connection here, and it's an important, um, important thing to, um, to discuss, I guess. So when we talked about prayer last week, just a, a couple of kind of quick quick connections, right? So prayer in its basic form is just talking to God, right? In this conversation with God. So it begins with God's the first one who speaks to us and we listen and then we speak back, right? So um, in that very basic sense, that's also what worship is, where God first comes to us and God acts and then we respond back to him. So this is why um, in, in Lutheranism, the, um, the word that we typically use, come on in, find a seat, wherever you can, you're fine. Um, but the words we typically use to call the church service is the divine service. Right? And that comes from the, um, from the German Gottesdienst, which means God's service. So when we say divine service, we're just saying this is God serving his people. And then after, when his people receive, then they respond back, right? So God speaks to us, we speak back. And that's all, that's all that is. So there's this basic movement back, um, back and forth with God being the, the, um, the one that initiates that and then us just responding, right? <clears throat> so you can see this as well in the, um, in the church service, in the, tr in the traditional type, you see this this kind of movement and conversation better than you would in a contemporary kind of setting. So um, the words we typically use for this are sacrificial and sacramental. So sacramental would be God's action towards us. Sacrificial is our actions back towards God or to one another. Okay? So... Um, you see this most notably in the direction that the pastor stands, right? So sometimes I stand um, facing the congregation, right? And so when I'm standing facing the congregation as the pastor, um, my job is to say, this is what God has to say, right? So that's where I'm just, I'm reading scripture. Um, the sermon would be part of this and, and some of that kind of stuff. Now, when I turn around, um, it's not that I'm turning my back to you guys, but rather I'm, I'm turning to face the same direction as you, right? And so now I'm speaking along with you to God, right? So the parts when the pastor faced the altar is the sacrificial part where we're speaking to God. The parts where the pastor is speaking, turning towards the people, that's the sacramental where God is talking to us, Okay. And then there's some other little things in there that get, throw that off when it comes to communion. And do you have an altar up against the wall or one that's freestanding so that's pulled out from the wall a little bit? And where, you know, where would the pastor stand in relationship to that, right? But Is there any significance, when you, because I have seen churches where it, it, the... the, the the altar is so, I mean, you, that they walk around yeah. the altar. Yeah. Yes. Yes, there is. Ryan, come here. How did you see me? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I heard you. Hey, good night. I love you. We'll see you later, okay? Mom, you 
the joys of living right next to the church, right, is this is almost just an extension of his house. Yeah, he's here all the time. He knows the code to get into the door. That's pretty great. Yeah, it's not, 90% of the time I don't complain about that, but sometimes I do. Um, So, yeah, so, yeah, so when you, when you have an altar, so we have a wall altar, right? right? So it's up against the wall. And that is by far the most, the more traditional historical way of doing it. Um, But then you have some where the altars are pulled away and then the pastor would walk around behind the altar. And there are certain parts where they, he could stand behind the altar and do things. So that, the, the freestanding altar kind of, changes perspective somewhat because then just because the pastor is standing behind the altar and facing the people that doesn't mean he's not talking to God still because then in that kind of sense the focal point of where you know kind of where would we say you know we're talking to and directing our attention to is to is to the altar Mm-hmm. Right. Is that kind of okay. modern, um... So in the Roman Catholic churches, that came in the 1960s, and that's um, when the Second Vatican Council, which was a very, very important one, that's where for the Catholics they turned, they changed, and you can now do it in English. Um, you had a whole revamping of their church services, and there's an old saying, saying is that um, um, basically when um, <clears throat> Um, whenever uh, Rome catches a cold, Lutherans sneeze. Right? So that means when they do something, then we kind of follow suit. Right? And it wasn't just us, but this changed a lot of Protestant denominations too in the way that in the 1960s. So one of the things they did was they felt that it was uninviting where, when the priest would, and they would put, it puts it this way, then when the priest turns his back to the people. But it was never he's turning his back to the people. It's always he's turning and facing the same direction. Just like if you have the, you, you guys in the front don't have your backs to the behind you. You're all just facing this way. There's no other way to do it unless we have this big long line. Um, um, and so the freestanding altar gets pulled out and done that on um, the Second Vatican Council, and you see a lot of other churches kind of follow suit. But Luther actually advocated for doing this very strongly, but no Luther, or rarely did any Lutheran churches do it. But his whole thing was revolved around the words of institution for the Lord's Supper. Is because he said these are words of gospel that are spoken, yes, over the bread and the wine, but are spoken to the people, not to God. In the Roman Catholic theology, the words are spoken to God as the priest offers a re-sacrifice of the body and the blood of Jesus. And so Luther said, well, it's not, we're not re-sacrificing Jesus. He died once for all. One time, that, that does it. So we are not doing anything to God. God, in, in communion, God's doing something to us and for us. So he said, so it's much better then to say the words of institution uh, over the elements, but also facing the people. And there's only a couple ways of doing that. If you want to do both of those motions, is one, you take the elements. So say if the altar is right here, right? I take it, I pick it up, and I turn around, and I say the words like this, right? So I have the bread or the wine right here. So I'm saying it over the elements, but also to you all. Or you pull the altar out. And so then you go behind the altar and then do it that way, mm. right? <clears throat> and his whole thing was these, he, he wanted the words of institution to be viewed as, as a sacra, sacramental action of God, God to us, not us to God. And so he wanted the pastor's posture to model that, right? So, but not a lot of Lutheran churches did that. Some of it was just the church architecture that already existed. 
and especially if you have an altar that's built basically built into the side of the wall or it's stone and weighs a thousand pounds you're not going to move it right <laughs> but as new churches got built that then became more of a consideration is how do you do that right so in what some churches, you see this in the Catholic Church a lot, and this also plays into um, um, Anglicanism and Episcopalian, so those are the same, right? Anglicans are England, Episcopalians were the American version of Anglicans. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's kind of the basics, right? The, um, so what they would do is they would have an altar like ours, a wall altar, and then they would build another one out front. So you'd have two altars. And you'd put communion on the lower altar. So it's called the higher altar because you have to walk up steps to get there. So you have a high altar and you have a low altar. Which then becomes, particularly in Anglicanism, the way they talked about it, high church and low church. Right? So when we use high church and low church, sometimes we're referring to more, more liturgical and formal and maybe less or contemporary. That's not really what that refers to. What it refers to is in Anglicanism is which altar do you use? And that was almost exclusively determined on the Anglican view of what's actually happening. So the Anglicans that viewed communion as the real body, the real presence of the body and blood of Christ used the high altar. Those that viewed it more as, as symbolic used the low altar. Right. So it's really a reference to communion practice, not how formal or informal or liturgical or contemporary the church services are. Um, but we don't, people get all, that all mixed up. So, anyway, my original point to all of this stuff, right, is that what we do in prayer and what we do in worship aren't that different. Like the posture, who's speaking and who's speaking back and responding and that kind of stuff. Now because of that, too, we, we run into a couple of, of problems, not problems, or um, issues that, that the church has to work through. Is prayer an act of worship? And I would say in a certain sense, absolutely it is. Of course it is, right? If you are responding back to God who's, who has spoken to you and I'm offering my prayer, my praise, my thanksgiving, adoration, all that kind of stuff, of course it is, right? So in, then how appropriate is it to pray with somebody that you do not have agreement with in belief? So there's two fancy terms, okay? Here are the two fancy terms. One is called syncretism. Syncretism, so like you're syncing and bringing stuff together, okay? Syncretism is basically worshiping with non-Christians. So we would include praying with those who are not Christian. We would call that syncretism, and we would say that's out of bounds because you're not praying to the same God, right? So you didn't see Elijah and the prophets of Baal getting together and saying, let's just have a joint worship service even though we believe in different gods, right? That's not how that happened, okay? And God says you shall, I mean, first commandment, right? You shall have no other gods, okay? So, um... Where, where this gets sticky then is, it's easy to say no worship, you know, it wouldn't be appropriate for us to join in joint worship with Mormons or Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists. And that doesn't mean you have, a, you know, someone who's Muslim or Mormon come into the church service and kind of, that's like official getting everybody getting together and doing that, Right. So you'd say that's not um, that's that's wrong. That's sinful against the first commandment. Okay, praying then would be an extension of that. So I'm not going to pray with the Muslim because the Muslim's praying to a different god. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. The other word is unionism. Union 
unionism. And unionism is would be joint worship between different Christians denominations, right? So you have syncretism, which is Christian and non-Christian. Unionism is Christians and Christians, but Christians of different denominations. So there's a reason why um, I don't call over to College Church of the Nazarene, you know, three blocks away over or that way, right? And say, hey, um, pastor um, of, of the Nazarene Church, why don't you come over and we'll, we'll do a joint church service, right? And so you do part, I do part, and everything. That would be unionism because we say, now wait a minute, yes, I acknowledge you're Christian, but I also acknowledge there's some pretty big differences, right? And, and we have different views on some pretty important things, and so that prevents us from joining together in that kind of worship with one another. Because it's not, that's not a judgment of you're not Christian. That's a judgment of you are Christian, but we have some pretty, we have differences that are serious and those differences matter. And Jesus desires for us to be in unity of faith, of doctrine, of what we believe. And that sort of thing. So we want to work towards that. So let's have conversations and hopefully work towards that. And once we get there, then we can. Right? So syncretism, Christians, non-Christians, unionism is with, within different denominations of Christians. So part of the problem then too is, well, what about praying? Everybody pretty much agrees that well, we shouldn't pray with a Muslim or a Mormon because they believe in different gods. Right? Um, but what about the Nazarene? Um, I, they believe in the same God, but does my praying, so part of this is perception, and part of it also is um, what is prayer. So is me praying with the Nazarene, is that giving the perception that we believe the same, exactly the same things? Or does it just give the impression <clears throat> we believe in the same God and so we're talking to the same God? Depends on the prayer. I think it partly depends on the prayer and the situation. Like praying for a person. Okay. In that right. Religion or that. Okay. Faith or are you praying to? Are are you worshiping God in that prayer specifically? Okay. So and that's that's where the question comes down. So different Lutheran denominations answer this question a little bit differently when it comes to prayer, okay? So the Missouri Synod, uh, I'm not going to count the ELCA because they've gone too far <laughs> off the rock. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, the LCMS says it's, it is okay in kind of private or even kind of communal settings, you know, like families, that kind of stuff, Right? group settings, to pray with people of different Christian denominations as long as they are praying in, in a recognition of it's the same God, right? So if they're a Christian, you'd say, okay, I could pray with my, with my Nazarene friends or my Baptist relatives or my Roman Catholics, you know, whatever. You could pray in, you know, for say if we're all eating a meal together and it's okay to pray together in that sense, right? So LCMS says that's okay. Um, worship, like a jo it's okay even to go to one of their church services, right? That's, we would say, well, that's not sinful, but you also need to be aware there are some differences, and so maybe there's some, some things that we shouldn't fully participate in in that regard. And we're going to get to that more, especially when, it talks, when we get to communion, right, and what kind of fellowship that implies and requires, right? Um, so, you know, you could go to the Nazarene church and, and go to church there. You could go to the Roman Catholic church and the Baptist church and the Pentecostal church and that kind of thing. Um, um, so we could say, um, so you have that, but it's not appropriate for, again, for the Nazarene pastor to come here and preach a sermon here because there's differences, right? So we'd say, well, that's, that's not the same. Or some communities will have like a joint Thanksgiving service 
right? And say, well, let's get all the Christian denominations together and they'll all, you know, each pastor will kind of do a different prayer part or whatever. And the LCMS official position is, no, that's unionism. That's, that's not recognizing the serious divisions that exist. Right? So you have that. Wisconsin Synod takes it, and um, to an extent the Evangelical Lutheran Synod, although there's, there's a slight difference in the way they treat this, the Wisconsin Synod said, no, prayer fellowship is the same. Prayer is the same as worship fellowship, is the same as communion fellowship. So they're all equal. So in a very strict sense, and I know a lot of Wisconsin Synod pastors that don't follow this, but in a very strict sense, the Wisconsin Synod official stance is you should not pray with anybody who's not Wisconsin Synod. Mm -hmm. Because by praying with them, you're implying you believe the same things. And we would say, well, not, our answer is, well, not necessarily. It depends. It might, but it also might not. So it kind of is situational. So from our perspective, we think the Wisconsin Synod kind of takes that a little too far. And they have some reasons and some good reasons as to why they do that and why they believe that way. Um, I think they're a little off on, on that. And some of that's theological reasons. Some of it's the, the um, I mean this in a good way, the, the history and the baggage that, that the Wisconsin Synod has is different than the history and the baggage that the Missouri Synod has. And so they have these different experiences which have helped to shape why they've gotten to where each has gotten to where they currently are at the current time. How does this all apply when you are out speaking to people that don't know Christ or that right. ask you for prayer right. for them? Yeah. Yeah. So How does this all apply to, to those people? Right. So again, this is and this is where some of this stuff gets gets a little more complicated. Because when you get into formal worship, you know, recognized worship services, that's much easier to make those distinctions. Mm -hmm. When you're um, doing evangelism, especially with those who aren't mm -hmm. Christian, then you have a little different. Um, you, even if you way. have, even if you're having a dinner, family dinner. Yeah. I mean, you have a, a member of your family who's a non-believer. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, you assume that they're probably not praying during the prayer. Right. Right. So, I mean, yeah. So it's, I mean, this stuff happens all the time. So we would say, um, we, yes, you can go ahead. I mean, certainly you should pray for them. So there's a difference of praying for and praying with. Right. So you could certainly absolutely pray for them, right? Um, pray for the situation, you know, that you're in. Um, if, say, though, if you have that family member and they're, um, they're kind of gone to the new agey kind of Buddhist thing and they're like, well, I'm going to pray to, you know, whatever my higher power is that I Gaya. believe in. Gaya. Yeah, right? <laughs> and you say, well... Um, no. That's not, I mean, it depends on where, are they at your house? I mean, because you can also say, well, if you're in my house, you're going to operate by my rules. If I'm in your house, I'll be respectful of your rules, right? So you have a little bit of that that, that would depend, but you could also say, you know, well, if you want to pray to that, um, okay, but I am not going to join together in praying with you in that way. And I'll still be... Stand respectful. I'm not going to make a big, you know. I mean, there's ways of doing it so you're not a jerk about it, right? But still saying, no, this is where I draw the line, right? And I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that because I recognize there's some pretty serious differences here, right? Yeah, um, it's a little different, um, you know. So the LCMS got itself in a. Um, I'm going to transition soon. <laughs> to baptism, because that's really what I want to talk about tonight. But the LCMS got it, got itself in trouble twenty years ago, heavily with the, like internally, um, in this regard, um, right after nine eleven. So there was a, um, um, and I'll go to one more thing back in history at, behind that. Um, but 
9-11, they had in Yankee Stadium, about a month or so afterwards, they had this big joint prayer time. And the way they build it was, we're just um, build, B-I-L-L-E-D, that's what I meant, like promoted it, right? Is that, okay, we're going to have all of these different faith communities from New York that has, you know, a gazillion different religions, you know, come in and, you know, have a little time and, you know, they could each can kind of take their turn praying, okay? And the, um, the district president of that area, the LCMS district president, um, got that invitation and he said, well, this is a great opportunity to share the hope that we have in Christ and the answer to suffering and death and injustice and that kind of thing. So um, he, he joined in with that. Now, even though it's promoted as, and they even say, well, this isn't really a worship service. You know, we're just going to have these different groups. If, when you actually watch it, it absolutely is a worship service. I mean, nobody in their right mind would think otherwise. Um, and you get, pull some random person off the street that doesn't know anything, and they'll say, oh, yeah, that's all. That's all worship. And then they'll also say, well, that's all, you know, you got the, your Hindus and your Buddhists and your Muslims and your Jews and your Christians, and um, they're all the same, right? Okay. So Christianity is just one among many. And that's certainly. And then the, the pat, and I will be critical here, because I think he utterly failed that his, his prayer was, was completely inept. And it's it wasn't it it's not necessarily a bad prayer, if it would have been in kind of your normal church service setting over over a really bad tragedy, but for somebody who said I'm going to do this so that I could specifically proclaim Christ, he didn't do that, um, and he got a lot of flack for it, and rightly so. Um, he executed it poorly, and I don't doubt his intentions at all. I think he I think he really wanted to share the gospel in a bad time to people and he did a really bad job of it. And it caused a big controversy in the LCMS on what's appropriate, what's not. I mean, he had charges brought up against him. Really? Um, within the church? Within the church to excommunicate him because of this. No. In part because that same year they had one of the most liberal synod presidents elected that the LCMS has ever had since the 1960s, which brings me back to one other instance, and then we'll go to baptism. <laughs> the big thing that happened, um, you have this history of, um, of the different Lutheran denominations. Well, in the 1960s, before that, you had what was called the General Conference, Okay. And you had different Lutheran denominations that were in fellowship with each other, like the LCMS and the Wisconsin Synod and the ELS. And so much so, they even produced this nice little joint hymnal called the Lutheran Hymnal in 1941. So the vast majority of Lutherans used, in the United States, used that hymnal. Okay? Um... In the 1960s, the LCMS started to get um, um, started to be infected by a certain kind of liberal theology called the historical critical method, which basically deconstructs the Old Testament. Okay, and they brought this over from mainland um, Europe, and that's how it got in there. And what it so they started doing this, and so they started viewing and interpreting the Bible in different ways, basically saying, well, a lot of this stuff is just culturally, um, you know, sensitive and implied. And so when Paul is saying, you know, women should, you know, need to remain silent in the church, um, I mean, that was just kind of for that time and place, but that doesn't really apply nowadays, right? So at this time, you have this con this these different Lutheran denominations working together. They still remain had their autonomy, but a Luth an LCMS pastor could be called to be the pastor of a Wisconsin Synod church, and vice versa. Okay. Then the LCMS starts to flirt 
with the American Lutheran Church, the ALC. Okay? The ALC in the 1960s started to ordain women. Okay? In the 60s. Yeah, they were one of the first ones to do it. So they start to ordain women, and the LCMS is working towards having full fellowship with them. So not just praying with them, but hey, let's swap pastors and, and churches and that kind of thing. So they start to do, do this. The Wisconsin Synod and the Evangelical Lutheran Synod said, mm, that makes us really uncomfortable. Mm. Right? Now, there's a group in the Wisconsin Synod Church that said, we gotta, you can't have it both ways. It's either us or them. And it didn't happen fast enough, so they broke off and created what's called the Church of the Lutheran Confession. And I think you know, or your mom knows a little bit about that. Probably my mom. Your mom yeah. knows some about yeah. that. Yeah. So they break off, um, and then, um, um, you know, Missouri Synod just kind of shrugged it off. What, you know? What do we care? Then the Wisconsin Synod finally says, no, us or them. You got to choose. And the Missouri Synod chose the American Lutheran Church. And so Wisconsin Synod said, fine, we're done with you guys. Right? So that broke off. Now, um, you also had brothers that were presidents of the Synod, or cousins maybe at the time too so there was more than just official I mean there's family squabbles going on like literal family squabbles going on too. so they broke off and the Evangelical Lutheran Synod followed along with them with the Wisconsin Synod so when that was going on what this ended up leading to in the Missouri Synod is called Seminex, which is the seminary in exile, where you had about 90% of the professors and student body at the main Lutheran um, um, Missouri Synod Seminary in St. Louis, which at the time, I think, was the third largest Christian seminary in the world, something like that. I mean, it was very large, very influential worldwide, denomination wide 90% of them walk out and it's because it was over this kind of liberalism and the ones that walked out were the liberals because the Missouri Synod started to correct their course and then said seminary you got to stop teaching some of this weird stuff that you were teaching so and they I mean they were denying creation saying things like um, the flood is just a myth Jonah, um, that's all allegorical, that didn't really happen. Um, there were even some saying, you know, Jesus and Mary Magdalene got married and had children. Um, I mean, that stuff is weird. Back. Yeah, right? So, so these all guys leave, and this is called the seminary in exile, or seminex. Those are all the liberals. Those are all the liberals that ended up forming the American Evangelical Lutheran Church, the AELC. AELC. Now, shortly after that, Missouri Synod and the American Lutheran Church, this was going to be my lesson for like two weeks from now, so I'm <laughs> totally kidding. The American Lutheran Church and the LCMS were working on a new hymnal. This was the green one. Lutheran Book of Worship. This is the hymnal they were working on. Right at the last minute, the LCMS pulled out and said, we can't do it. So what they did, the LCMS revised this and created this one called Lutheran Worship. So this came out in like 79, and this was 81, 82, something like that. Okay, And they took out some of the objective stuff. Um, so that's where we get these new, this hymnal that comes from, which nobody liked. Nobody liked this one. So um, that happens. Then um, in um, 1987, the, um, the AELC, the American Evangelical Lutheran Church, which were the liberal ones that left the Missouri Synod, joined together with the Lutheran Church of America, the LCA, and the American Lutheran Church, to create the Amer or the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, the ELCA. Okay. 
Now, part of the American Lutheran Church didn't want to go along with that. They ended up creating the AALC, which is where you guys came from, right? And that only that was only like 35 <clears throat> congregations. I mean, it was a really small amount. So the Association of American oh, okay. Lutheran Churches, which then in 2007 joined in the fellowship with the Missouri Synod. Mm -hmm. So the AALC is to the Missouri Synod the way the ELS is to Wisconsin. Okay. Okay. So, you have those, those groups all joined together. Um, basically, all the liberals got together and created a new denom Lutheran denomination. And, uh, um, which is also the fastest declining <laughs> Christian denomination in history. Yeah. Really? Yeah. So they started with like eight or nine million, you know, in the, in the late 80s. And now they're down to like four. I mean, they've lost over 50% of their membership. Well, is um, it any wonder if they're denying? Well, I mean, to us, no. It's like, well, that's, yeah, it's because you've gone off. And it didn't start, I mean, they, they, were, they were headed that direction. But in the early 2000s, they took a sharp left turn. Yeah. And they started to um, ordain homosexuals, and, and then they promote it. Mm -hmm. Then in the 2019 National Youth Gathering of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, you have one of the most prominent pastors in that church body. Her name is Nadia Boltz Weber. She lives in um, Colorado. Um, flat out said, if you believe in the traditional view of marriage and sexuality, you're going to hell. Wow. If you believe that's what it is, you're going to hell. Is she still a... Oh, yeah. I mean, she's, she's the big celebrity. Yeah. Right now, she is. Oh, man. And she's, she is um, the most potty-mouthed, crude, um, e explicit... Oh, why? Um, why do they keep her there? They love her. Because that's what the ALCA's become, and it's a, it's a tragedy. It is such a tragedy. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, all all of these things are related to worship, prayer, fellowship with one another. How you answer these questions, and to what degree? Where do you draw the line in the sand? To say, um, um, I can't cross this line in my worship or my prayer because of the differences in belief or even differences in different gods, in belief in different gods, right? So Missouri Synod, thankfully, is course corrected. Um, Wisconsin Synod um, I mean, uh, kind of veered a little more to, uh, to one direction as well and kind of held firm to this, and, and in a certain sense, rightly so, because... Um, they, they probably should have cut ties with us or sooner than they did. Um, but they did it. Um, I think most, the vast majority of those issues are dealt with and not really issues in the Missouri Synod anymore. Um, but there's still, this is still in the living memory of people. And that's hard when you have families, churches, um, that kind of thing that still remember the pain of that kind of separation. And then family members saying, um, I'm Wisconsin, you're Missouri, um, we live in the same town, um, but now I, I won't pray with you anymore. Right? So the pain, even if that was a right answer, which I don't think it is, but even if it was, the pain of that, you know, 50 years, 60 years later, still lingers. Oh, this this one. Mm -hmm. When did this? Nineteen forty one. And this was by which church bodies brought that? To this you? was um, the um, the Evangelical Lutheran Synodical Conference of North America. So Wisconsin Synod was part of this, and um, Missouri Synod. Um, I I don't know if the I think the English Synod was gone by then and wrapped up into the LCMS. Like the um, church but, that um, we were married in used, where I first started, used that. Right. But I don't know what synod they were. Yeah. Could have been, could have been four or five different ones. Okay. Yeah.
So this was by far, this is called the Lutheran hymnal, this was by far the most common hymnal within American and Canadian Lutheranism for, for gener two generations at least. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So then what we have now, this one came out in 2006. Yeah. So there's still churches that use this. The, um, a lot of the LCMS churches use this. Like, um, hardly anybody uses this. Most everybody said thank you for getting for making that obsolete <laughs> now. Um, but this one, real quick, this one takes the best, or it, the idea was let's take the best out of here and the best out of here mm -hmm. and put them in one volume. Um, and a lot of what they did corrected the bad things that were in here. And they weren't that bad, honestly. They weren't that bad. But it corrected a lot of the stuff in here and really made it more like this. Yeah. The previous church um, used the, the red one. Okay. And uh, several years ago, they were talking about moving to a more modern version. Mm -hmm. So they took a poll and they ended up staying with the old yeah. one and getting new copies Just of the new old Just new copies one. of the old one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you can still buy. I mean, this, this copy is only printed. Um, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. So mm -hmm. you can still buy brand new um, printed versions of this. It's a good hymnal, a, good, a very good hymnal. My favorite hymnal is the Evangelical Lutheran Synod's hymnal. It's called the Evangelical Lutheran Hymnary. It's a fantastic hymnal. Um, took four guys one year to do it. <laughs> yeah, but they're a really small church body and you, things move faster without the bureaucracy. Yeah. But it's a very good hymnal. Very, very good hymnal. It's the most Lutheran in the sense of it has the most hymns that were written by Luther and Lutherans in it. Um, and it has, it's very, very strong in law and gospel and in distinctions um, and that kind of thing. Um, and it's, it's very liturgical and designed for, for liturgical services, the traditional stuff. Um, yeah. So it's a it's a good hymnal, it's a good hymnal. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, that went on way longer than I was in the planning. So what I want to do now, and this might bleed over into, um, it will bleed over into next week for um, for a couple of different reasons, but <clears throat> I want to kind of shift gears and talk a little bit about baptism today. So um, we're getting into now um, the sacraments. Right, and what we call um, what we call sacraments, and what we define them as. So, um, if you have if you have this hymnal or this um, um, catechism, you have a nice little introduction in here to what sacraments are. Um, and I'm not sure if yours has it there or not. But um, in on page 281, yeah. Page 281 in this one. It's, I think it's a similar thing as in that one. I think. It's, in be, it's right after the Lord's Prayer. So, what we, um, we talk about sacraments, and in, in, we use two different terms sometimes. Um, the first term um, that I'll talk about really is, um, is just the actual term of the sacrament. Or sacrament. So sacrament comes, it's a Latin ver word, which is a translation of a Greek word, mysterion, which means mystery. So the sacraments are, the, are mysteries. Okay? Now, in Lutheranism, um, if you turn to page 282 in this one, you have um, um, a question at the top of the page what is a sacrament? So the Lutheran Church usually, and that's a key word, usually, not always, <laughs> usually, speaks of a sacrament as this. It's a sacred act. So it's a holy, it's a sacred act. It's instituted by the command of Christ. So Jesus says, do this. Right? In which Christ joins his word of promise to a visible element. So there's something visible, intangible, and, and Jesus' promise attached to it. And then lastly, by which he offers and bestows the forgiveness of sins he's earned for us by his suffering, death, and resurrection. So, 
It's a sacred act. Jesus says do it, right? And it's combined with something physical, right? The promise of God with something physical connected to it. And it actually delivers forgiveness of sins. Okay? Now, that's how we define sacrament. If you go to a Roman Catholic church, or if you go to an Episcopalian church, they're going to define that a little bit differently. Which is why Roman Catholics will say, well, there's seven sacraments. And we'll say, well, no, we would say there's two, maybe three. Right? Um, um, part of that is because we're defining this a little bit differently on what makes a sacrament. So the Bible doesn't say, there isn't a Bible verse that says this is what a sacrament is and then lists it. Right? So that's a term that the church has adopted to use to describe a sacred act instituted by the command of Christ in which he joins his order promise to a visible element and that which he you know, delivers forgiveness from. Okay? So, um, in the Lutheran church then, um, I mean, the next, the next question is how many are there? Well, <clears throat> um, it leaves the exact numbering of the sacraments open. Okay? Usually it's, talked, it's defined as two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Sometimes um, a third one is added, which would be absolution. You know, where the absolution, so the pronouncement of forgiveness, where the absolution gets, where there's question is, is there, where's the physical, visible element in absolution? And they'd say, well, it's the person who's speaking it. Okay, so that's how you, that's how you could answer that. So in baptism, what's the visible element? The physical water, right? In communion, bread and wine, right? Bread and wine. So you have the word of God combined with the physical things, okay? So this is why sometimes, too, um, we'll also talk about the term means of grace, right? So the means of grace would include the sacraments as well as the word of God, Okay, and the means of grace are simply, if God, God is a gracious God, right? I mean, we all agree on that. God is gracious. Um, so how does God get his grace that's up there in heaven down to us here on earth, right? So the means of grace is the delivery method on how he, how he delivers what Jesus won for us 2,000 years ago, right? So the means of grace, so how, do, how does God forgive us? Well, it's, it's um, right, you can answer two ways. How? Well, when Jesus dies on the cross, right? That's how God forgives us, is by Jesus' death and his resurrection. Okay. But how does he forgive me, right? How does he get that to me? Well, he gets that to me in baptism, in the Lord's Supper, and when the word of God is proclaimed, you're forgiven. Okay. Right? So that's the means of grace. So the key thing then in the way that we do this is the means of grace the sacra and the sacraments and the word right, primarily are God's action to people. God's action to people. And this is going to be the big defining thing between the Christian denominations. Who is doing the action? Right? Who's doing it? Our answer is God is doing this. And he's using these means, these methods, to deliver grace to his people. Okay. So, that means that we believe that baptism actually does something. Right? That the Lord's Supper actually does something. That God, because God is the one who's doing it to us. Whereas, if you, if you swap that posture, and this is why I wanted to talk about some of the prayer and worship thing. God to us. If you swap the posture around and it's us doing it for God, then it's works. And then it either isn't doing anything because, okay, so like we take a Baptist. Or I won't take a Baptist, they're too cliche in this. I'll take a Nazarene because we have Nazarenes here, right? So Nazarenes believe in a believer's baptism is what they would say. So you have to make the decision and the choice to be baptized. So they'd say, well, what does baptism do? 
Well, it doesn't do anything for them. They do it because Jesus said you need to be baptized. And by doing it, now you are showing God in your community that you believe and that you want to dedicate your life to God. Okay? So that's all the person doing something for God. But then baptism itself doesn't actually do anything. Because for the Nazarene, they say, well, yeah, we believe you're saved by grace. So baptism can't do any. It can't be a work. Because if I'm the one doing it, if it's a work, then that clashes with salvation by grace. Right? That's also the big complaint when it comes to Lutherans, Catholics, Orthodox, some Episcopalians, and the, the ones who actually believe that these things do, that it's God's action, is if, they, if we say, um, baptism actually forgives my sin, and they say, well, that can't be. Because if baptism is something you do, you can't do something to earn forgiveness. Right? So that contradicts each other. And you say, well, baptism is a work, but it's not my work. It's God's work right. upon me. And if it's God's work upon me, then of course it's, then yeah, it's, it's by grace. Right? So it's going to be a big distinction is who's doing the action. And the only way to determine that, of course, is to, is to read scripture, right? How does the Bible talk about baptism and the Lord's Supper and absolution? Who is doing the action? Me or God to me, right? And that's how we answer it, and I think it's very clear. Um, and that's, this is the big sticking point with people in different, between churches, um, there's more, but these things, who is doing the action in this? And if God's also the one doing the action, then, th then um, the issues of how old do you have to be when you're baptized? Can you baptize babies? <clears throat> um, that, that, that question's answered. Because if it's God doing it, and it's by grace, then of course it could be to a baby. Right? And I'm going to touch on that again here in just a minute. Before I do that, though, in the catechism, I just um, um, I want to look at uh, what Luther says about this, so that just the, the meaning of what this stuff is. Um, so whatever catechism you have, um, first of all, um, it starts off, and this is how Luther writes it um, when he gets to, to the baptism part. First, as the head of the family should teach it in a simple way to the household, which means parents should be teaching this to their kids, right? Um, so, what is it? That's his first question. Okay, so um, in whatever catechism you have, what is baptism? And Luther says, baptism is not just plain water, it is the water included in God's command and combined with God's word. Okay? So it's not just water being thrown on somebody or somebody dunked into it or whatever, but it's water including in God's command. So God says do, use water and combined with his word. Next question then was, well, what's the word? Right? Which is that word of God? Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that's the word of God that's combined with the visible, physical thing, water, that makes a baptism. And if it's God who's doing the action upon the person who is baptized, then it does something. Right? So, I took, uh, when I was in seminary, I took a 10-week course on baptism. Eight weeks, we looked at Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. That was it. Eight weeks on just this one verse. I knew it forward, literally, forwards and backwards. And in Greek, you could also mix words up. Um, word order doesn't always matter. I knew it frontward, backward, and mixed up um, in Greek. Because um, we spent eight whole weeks just looking at this one thing and what Jesus says and what mm -hmm. Jesus is doing. Is that eight weeks once a week? Uh, three times a week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my yeah. So 24 one hour sessions. Oh, wow. Yeah. That was a lot. I mean, we could have done it in half the time, honestly. But yeah, that was a lot. <laughs> so, baptism is the water, the word of God. Jesus says, do it. 
right? Where does he say to do it? In Matthew 18. What's the word that needs to be attached with the water? Matthew, Matthew, um, Matthew 28, sorry. Matthew 28, right? So, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in all, this also answers part of the question that we were talking about, right? So for us, we accept and recognize as valid any baptism where there's water and the Word of God. So whether it's in a Roman Catholic church or a Methodist church or a Nazarene church or a Pentecostal church, as long as there was water applied to a person in some fashion, and you have the words, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we say, that's good, because it's God, it's God's word, and that's where the power and the authority all comes from, is from God and his word. Now, where it gets tricky is when the words, lowercase w, are present, but the word, uppercase w, is not. And what I mean by that is, a Mormon will baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So they have the words present, lowercase w, but they have a very, very different meaning on what that is. So when they say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they mean their main God, Heavenly Father, His firstborn Son as a spirit baby, Jesus, right? And then a spirit in the same way that kind of you and I have a spirit. Okay, So Mormons are not um, monotheists. Mormons are polytheists. They have, um, there's potentially thousands and millions of God in Mormonism. Really? Yeah. So that would be like me saying, I'm just going to say right now, your name is Father, your name is Jesus, and your name is Holy Spirit. And so if I'm baptizing you, and I say in the name of the Father and in the Son and the Holy Spirit, but I'm referring to these three and not to God, we say that doesn't do anything because the word with the capital W isn't there. That also means we don't treat these things like some sort of magical incantation where if you just say the right words and you have the right recipe and you make your potion, that poof, something happens, right? And that's actually how Roman Catholics believe it, which is, um, it's, the Latin phrase is ex opera operato, is by doing the deed. And we'd say, well, no, because it rests on, it, it's, first it's not dependent upon me, but it rests upon the word of God. But there does have to be faith, the word of God has to be present, and the word of God is more bigger than just the literal words with the lowercase w. Right? So if you mean something different than the triune God, then we'd say it's not a real baptism. So Lutherans don't ever rebaptize, but sometimes we do recognize what you had wasn't a real baptism, and so we need to baptize you for real. And that would be for like Jehovah's Witness some of the non-Trinitarian Pentecostals. Unitarianism. Um, Unitarianism would be the same way. We'd say that's not a real Christian. You didn't have a real Christian baptism. The only exception, maybe, to that would be somebody, and I did this, the guy that lives right across the street, right over there, his name is Jeff. Wonderful, very nice man who hasn't been to church in a year and a half, and it drives me nuts, and I tell him that. <laughs> drives me nuts. Um, very nice man, though. Um, he, um, he, he approached me one time and he goes, I don't, he goes, I think I've been baptized, but I'm not sure. I think he goes, I would have been in a Catholic church, but my mom and dad don't have any recollection of it happening. Mm -hmm. Um, he goes, but they think it did, but there's no, they don't remember. There's no baptism certificate. They don't even remember which church it would have been at. Um, and so he says, I, he goes, this has really bothered me. I don't, I don't know if I am. And so in times like that, um, we actually, last Easter, right, during COVID, the church was shut down, but my wife, my son, and I, and Jeff showed up on Easter morning at nine o'clock in the morning, and I baptized him, <laughs> right? And that was for the sake of, well, maybe this happened, but you don't know. 
And so for the sake of assurance that, that this is real, we're going to do it. And so, you know, just in case you forget, here's a baptism certificate, and we have record of it here at the church so that we could always go back to it, right, to have that kind of assurance. Okay. Now, there's more to it than that. So let's keep going. So, baptism isn't just plain water. It's the water including God's command and his word. Matthew 28 is the word. So second, what benefits? So what does it do, right? It works forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this is the words and promises of God declare. So three big things. Forgives, rescues from death, and the devil, and gives eternal salvation. Okay, and then the next section, well, which are these words and promises of God, right? So where is this in the Bible? Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Mark, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Okay, that's a pretty important verse as well, right? So sometimes you'll get the question, do you have to be baptized to go to heaven? And the answer is no. You have to have faith to go to heaven. Right? You have to believe in Jesus. But a lack of baptism doesn't prevent a person to go to, going to heaven, but a lack of faith does. And this Bible verse talks about this. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Two things, right? Believes, baptized, you'll be saved. But whoever doesn't believe will be condemned. So that means if you believe and you're baptized, you go to heaven. It also means if you believe and you're not baptized, you go to heaven. Mm -hmm. If you do not believe and you're not baptized, you don't go. If you do not believe and you have been baptized, you don't go. <laughs> because you've denied, again, the faith and the grace and all this, the stuff that Jesus had to give on the cross. If, a, if that's being delivered to a person in baptism... And then a person says, no, thank you, God, I don't want it. Right? Then, and they don't believe, um, they will be condemned. If, if uh, you have a child that was baptized, mm -hmm. but they don't recognize that baptism as a child, okay. can they go have themselves baptized again? Okay. Well, I would say um, the first time worked and stuck even if you didn't un realize that that, that that was the case. It doesn't, yeah. Another baptism doesn't undo the first one. It doesn't, yeah. yeah. It doesn't undo the first one. I would say that. And what it is, when somebody makes that kind of jump, right, is now they're viewing baptism as something I'm doing for God. Because, and that's, that's a big hang-up for, for infant baptism. Is, well, I don't remember it, and I didn't make the choice. And you say, well, the choice, we are in responses. God's the one doing it. It's God's choice. It's not yours. Right? Your choice, though, now as someone who believes is to say, God forgave me. He rescued me from death and the devil and gives eternal salvation. So I'm going to hold on to that as tight as I can every day of my life. That's now what I do, and that's my response to this. Right? So when a person then starts to view baptism, though, as, um, well, that one didn't count because I don't remember and I didn't make the choice saying, well, that's not the point, right? Um, and so they're flipping around again, who does the work? And, but again, that doesn't invalidate the first one. Yeah, because our, our, our oldest son was baptized as a, as a child, mm -hmm. but then he got involved with a person that was Church of Christ? Or Church of Christ, Church of Christ mm -hmm. I think, and they told him that he needed to be rebaptized. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, and that's because they, they would view baptism as something as something you do for God, and a baby can't do that, or can't make that choice yet, right? And this, this actually brings up a, another important aspect of this, is, um, well, can babies believe? And our answer is, well, absolutely they can, because faith isn't a work that you do either. Faith is something you have, and something you're supposed to use, but it's something you have. Faith itself is a gift of God, not something you do. And faith, too, is not the same as understanding. Okay, And this is where Martin Luther goes when he talks about this, is faith and understanding aren't the same things. Oftentimes they go hand in hand, and we hope they do. right? Mm -hmm. But 
Faith and understanding are not identical. So, um, a lot of you have had children. Right? Does, um, and you don't even have to have kids to get this, right? Does a baby know who mom is and who a stranger is? Yeah. Yeah. Can they articulate that and explain that? No, other than maybe screaming and crying and throwing a fit, right? And what they know is, this is mom, and this is not. Right? That's what they know. So when a baby, and when a baby's baptized, it's the same thing. A baby can have that faith and know, this is God, and this is not. Can they articulate that? Well, no. Um, not yet, but as they grow, right, mom starts to teach, I'm mom, right, this is grandma, and this is your aunt, and this is a friend, right, but you don't call the friend mom, because I'm mom, and that's, that's a friend, right, I mean, so we teach that as they grow, just like you do in the Christian faith, you teach them more, and as they grow and mature, you you slowly feed them more and more, and, and you want their understanding and appreciation of that to grow, right? But that also goes to, what about, you know, faith and knowledge aren't, aren't the same thing. You know, what happens with, um, what happens if somebody gets Alzheimer's? The faith, is still the faith can still be there. Of course it is. Mm-hmm. Because... They've been baptized. They've heard the word of God, which delivered that faith to the person. And even if they can't articulate it, um, faith faith is God's working and God's yeah, doing God it. God would have to take no. that away from them. Yeah. Because their mind is yeah. gone. It's not their fault. Right. That... Yeah. And I mean, unless they outright, full out deny, but usually that includes you got to have a certain mental capacity to be able to say absolutely not I don't believe this I never have I never will and I'm going to go to my de- you know to my grave denying this um, I've never met an Alzheimer patient or so, who who does that right what I have met is an Alzheimer patient going in and saying hi do you remember me no okay well I'm from your church Zion Lutheran Church um, uh, there's this one woman <coughs> you still see her family name around town sometime, Munster. She was in her 90-something. Her husband was a barber and did some other things in the community. Um, and I said, well, um, she was a member here for 70-something years. And I said, well, I'm from your church, Zion Lutheran Church. Do you remember that? No. Okay. Um, she didn't know her kids. She didn't know anything. I mean, she didn't know where she was, when she was. Um, and But you know what she knew? She knew the Lord's Prayer. And if I ask, can you say the Lord's Prayer? She, I mean, she'd just stare. But if I went, our Father, who art in heaven, just like that. Wow. And um, she said, we sang the song at her funeral. You go in there, and she, I, I asked her this. Partly, I asked her this partly so I could tell you this. I said, do you know who Jesus is? And she just went, huh? And then I said, Jesus loves me, and she's saying it just like that, right? And I go, does Jesus, at the end, does Jesus love you? Yes, he does. Okay, right, that's faith. Even though her mind was gone, right, that's faith. And that's faith that God preserved even, even when her mind's left her, right? Um, and that's a beautiful thing, right? Faith and understanding aren't the same. They should go hand in hand, we want them to. But sometimes, sometimes they don't. Right? Now, in the same way, um, we have a young man. His picture is right over there on the box. Nick Whitney. He's um, in his fourth year of seminary at Concordia Saint, uh, no, Fort Wayne, um, in the Fort Wayne Seminary. When I would go back for my doctor classes, I usually stayed with them, um, which is just a joy. Um, child of the congregation here. His. Um, uh, he, um, he and his wife, they were pregnant with their first child. Um, she had uh, two weeks before the due date, preeclampsia. The child died. Oh. Right? Horrible thing. Right? Oh. Gave birth. Um, I, I don't know if this was a, um, a privilege. I don't know. I was there at the hospital when the mom got, um, came out of the room. I got to hold the baby. Right? And you know, the first question they asked is our son in heaven. Right? 
And you know what my answer was? Yes. Yeah. And do you know why? And it's not because it's an innocent, it's an innocent little baby, because that's a sinner who had died because of the effects of the sinful and a fallen world and a sinful and a fallen body. That's a sinner who Jesus died for and who Jesus saved. Even though that child hadn't been baptized, mom was in church, and that baby, those of you who have been moms, can your babies hear you in the womb? Can they hear God in the womb? You bet they can. Absolutely. Right. Um, Could that baby believe? Absolutely. Because faith comes by hearing the word. Right. Yeah. And that's a part of the reason why he wants to be a pastor. Is because that, that would do one of two things, right? Young couple, first child dies. That would either, was either going to destroy their faith and their marriage or make both of those things stronger. And that kind of suffering and pain and loss brought them closer together as a couple, brought them closer to God. And now they say, I want other people to know that kind of comfort, hope, answer, and knowledge of knowing, oh, get to see them again, right? I'm going to get to actually meet my child alive in the flesh on the day of resurrection. What a joy, right? And they, and you, they want other people to know that, right? Wow. That's pretty powerful, yeah. right? Very. So um, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. That child believed, right? That, that elderly lady <laughs> believed and she was baptized even though she couldn't articulate it. So, the next, <coughs> the next thing. Well, how can water do such great things? Well, certainly not just water, but the word of God in and with the water does these things, along with the faith which trusts this word of God in the water. So, it's not the water. The power is not in the water. The power is in the word of God. Right? So, um, for God, without God's word, the water is plain water and no baptism. But with the word of God, it is a baptism. That is a life-giving water, rich in grace, and a washing of the new birth in the Holy Spirit. As St. Paul says in Titus chapter 3. So now we got the Bible verse again, right? He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit who he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. So the washing of rebirth and renewal. So that means we believe in what's called baptismal regeneration or baptismal renewal. That in baptism, God, because it's God doing it, he regenerates, he renews an old sinful person and makes them a new person in Christ. And only God can do that, right? And since this is God's work, God does it. Right? And the power is in the word, not in the water. So as long as there's water in the word, so that could be water out of the tap, that could be filtered water, that could be a puddle of water out on the ground. The purity of the water doesn't matter, but the purity of the word does. Okay. So, do Lutherans have holy water? No. Right? Because it's not the water that's holy, it's the word that's holy. We have the holy Word of God combined with the water. Now, the water that's used in a baptism, that's um, <clears throat> because it's been used in a baptism, um, we don't just throw that down the, the sink drain when we're done either because we recognize this was used for a holy purpose. So we pour it down out on the ground. And to be respectful, even though I don't believe there's any power or anything special about the water, it was used for a special reason. So it's just out of respect, and that's how we deal with that. But I did figure out, um, do you know how to make holy water? You can make it. All of you can. You know how to do it? It's easy, right? You put it in a pot, you put it on the stove, and you boil the hell out of it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Sure, you weren't going to say we can bless it ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pop this guy out of Romans. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, <coughs> power's in the word, not in the water, but we got to have both. Yeah. The Bible, the catechism doesn't really, the catechism itself doesn't address this, although a lot of the explanations do. Well, how much water and in what method? 
right? So for us, um, actually, when you look at the word for baptize in the Bible, baptize literally means to wash, generally by immersing. So when you wash your dishes, you're going to put dip them down in water and wash your dishes. So sometimes some Christian denominations will say, well, baptism means immersing. Well, it doesn't. It means washing. Normally that washing is done by immersion, though. Okay? So those are, by, those are related but not synonymous. Because even in the Bible, and this is the common, a common excuse, but that word for baptism has also been used um, if you're going to wash your couch. You have a stain on your couch, you're going to watch your couch, or you're going to go dip it in a swimming pool. <laughs> you're going to apply water and clean it, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, <coughs> historically in the Christian church, depending on where you are, immersion has, um, was very common, but by far not everywhere. You go back even, I was going to try to find this and I didn't. <coughs> So I apologize, but you can go back and you can find churches um, and baptismal fonts and pools um, that are only about that big and about that deep. They go back to the year 150, 200. So they're not always going out to a river or a lake or pond and being baptized. Um, and they're not always immersing. Okay. Who wants to be immersed in Wisconsin in the middle of winter? Oh, well, not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, Luther, want, he preferred immersing. And he said it's a better picture because of this number, um, this next one. So let me read this. Um, it indicates, so what does it, uh, baptizing with water indicate? Again, it indicates that the old Adam and us should by daily contrition and repentance be drowned and die with all sins and evil desires and that a new man should daily emerge and arise to believe before God in righteousness and purity forever. Okay, old man daily, and this is, this is going to bleed over into our discussion next week, but the old man daily, through daily contrition and repentance, be drowned and die, and that the new man daily be raised. Where is this written? Romans 6. We're therefore buried with him through baptism and through death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might live a new of life. So in baptism, we're connected with Jesus' death and resurrection. <laughs> And because of this imagery of the old man drowning and dying and the new man being brought to life, Luther thought, wow, immersion sure does fit that imagery a lot better. Let's drown the old man. Let's bring the new man up out of that. Now, around the time of the Reformation, you started to have more of the radical Reformation saying you have to immerse. And so Lutherans went, oh yeah, watch this. Um, <laughs> sprinkle, sprinkle. Yeah. Right? Good with sprinkle, sprinkle. Right. Then when, um, and Catholics did a lot of the same thing. Um, and most of the churches in the medieval ages had fonts, not big pools. Um, that just became the most common way of doing things. Um, when, um, when in Lutheranism in particular, when we got to the United States, we, um, we had fonts, not pools, primarily just because of cost and expense, and it's easier to build something and use a bowl, you know, that's that big around, than build something you can go down and out of. But I have a plan. You guys ready for my plan? So right up front, up here in church. Okay. Um, you have where we kneel down for communion, and then there's a little area up there, and then you have the chancel. What I want is around that area where we kneel down for communion on the main level. What I want to do is I want to put, um, have a glass top so you could see down, but I want to put a, a baptistry there so you could go down into the water right there in the front. So when you come up front, you're reminded the waters of baptism. Okay? Um, preferably, the water should be, um, um, well, in some of the early Christian documents, they want cold running water. Okay. So the living water, right? So, um, so we want it running, okay, so it needs to be circulated. I prefer warm water because babies cry less. So and so we'll do it. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> you got it! <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, right? 
So I want to, you know, when I'm here working and I'm stuck on my sermon and I say, I need to be reminded of my bap- that I'm baptized. I'm going to go get in the hot tub. Can we come in for a Right, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I haven't convinced anybody in the church to actually build one here. Oh, it hasn't gone over yet? No, it hasn't. Yeah, I love it. We got a plumber here. Maybe you could help plumb that in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That yeah, good. that was really good. Yeah, yeah. So, um, anyway, um, so partly historical circumstances, partly out of a reaction of people saying you have to do it, Lutherans more often than not just do pouring or immersion. Um, um, I um, some people just kind of sprinkle. Sometimes there's like a little shell you can pour um, over. Um, I splash, I almost splash. I get water everywhere. I'm not stingy. I and I mean they're soaked by the time I'm done with it. So I can't immerse, but I can like dump the whole bowl on you. Um, so um, I mean it can happen in different ways. Um, I certainly am not. Um, I wouldn't object to somebody that wanted to be immersed. Um, I'd want to know why. I mean, if you think that's the only real way Where that it counts, I'm not here. In the bathroom? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, um, I was also going to show, maybe I can find this, this video too. There's an awesome, um, it's Eastern Orthodox. They <laughs> baptize infants too, but they do full immersion. Okay. And usually three times, they dunk them three times. <coughs> One's not enough. Right? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So it takes a, it's a, of this. Um, Eastern Orthodox priest, and they're doing all of these baptisms, so just like a line going through. And he gets the baby, and he's don't, don't, don't can him off. And next one, don't, don't, don't can him off. And the babies are <laughs> flailing all over. Yeah. Um, but the early, when, in, even in the early church, when they did immersions, they would still immerse babies. And um, it's not that, again, those of that kids, when you give, you have kind of a newborn, newborns are used to floating around in their mom's tummy, right? Yeah. They don't, what does a newborn do? Holds his breath. Holds his breath. Yeah. You just put them under and they go, and then they'll catch you and they bring them up and they don't care one little bit. Right? Unless it's ice cold water or something like that. I used to give swim lessons to babies. Oh, yeah. And they just do it. <laughs> yeah, and so that's no problem, and the church knew that. You just put them in there and baptize them and bring them out. It's not a big deal. The, the adults throw a bigger fit than the kids. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, um, the big takeaways, and again, some of this we're going to talk about next week because we're going to talk about um, um, confession and absolution, which really is um, it's, it's really kind of interesting. In the small catechism, there's the six main parts that we're going through, right? So baptism is four, confession absolution is five, and then the sacrament of the altar is six. Well, in the large catechism that Luther writes, there's only five sections. And he combines baptism and confession and absolution. Because what he says, what he's expanding on is this fourth aspect. Baptism indicates the old Adam and us should by daily contrition and repentance be drowned and die and that a new man in Christ is raised to life, right, based off of Romans 6. Well, what does that look like? Well, that looks like daily repenting of your sins and being re- forgiven. And that's, so that's what we're going to talk about next time. So that's just living the baptized life is a life of repentance and forgiveness and trust in God's grace and his mercy. Um, even, even to me, a poor sinful being, right? Um, so we're gonna, we'll draw next time. We'll draw that back to baptism um, over and over again because that's the basis for all of this stuff. Now um, we're kind of out of time, but just a, a, a very, very brief thing. There's, there's a lot more to baptism that we could talk about, um, and it's a, again, it's a big topic. The main thing is we, we view this as God's work towards us. And if it's God's work, then it's also salvific. So you have a passage in 1 Peter, right? This baptism now saves you, right? And it saves because God's the actor, 
If we are doing it, then it couldn't save us. Right? And that's something I, I personally, I've heard that several times. How can you baptize a baby because um, they can't do, you know, they can't make the decision, they can't, they can't choose. And then um, I'd say, well, they could have faith, they could believe, and that kind of stuff. And I believe, well, baptism saves. Well, baptism can't save because baptism is something you do. You're saying, well, no. That's the wrong church. Yeah, baptism is something that God does. So yeah, so in that sense, we could all say, yeah, I'm not saved by my works, but I am saved by the works of Christ, right? And that again, this is at the very heart of the gospel, is that we are declared righteous, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that grace is delivered in baptism, that faith is delivered in baptism, Jesus is delivered in baptism, right, and given to the person. Mm-hmm. So that now um, a person has Christ and is in Christ. Right? So next time, what I um, again, we'll kind of um, we'll talk about this repentance and faith. I also want to talk a little bit about um, um, <laughs> baptism as adoption, because that's um, that's a pretty important picture that we have to, and then that's that's going to all tie in together. Um, with this as well. And then if there's any other questions on baptism that I didn't answer, bring those next week so that we can um, we can maybe discuss some of that too. Right? Um, either, you know, more Bible verses about this or you know, what about this or that or whatever it may be. Okay? <coughs> um, um, not, then, this is the last thing we'll do, the closing um, part. Whenever um, in the church service, but as well as some other places. Um, we, um, sometimes we'll make the sign of the cross, right? I, I do it a lot, both this way, so it's like I'm tracing it over you, mm-hmm. right? Or um, this way. A handful of people in, in our church do that as well. And what that is a reminder of is that we're baptized, Right, because when you're baptized, there's a line in there in the baptism, right? Receive the sign of the cross upon your heart and upon your forehead to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. So when you make the sign of the cross, you're saying, I'm baptized. Does it matter which way you go? Um, Yes and no. (laughs) Catholics go forehead, center of the chest, left shoulder, right shoulder. Not right. just a left-handed person. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Lutherans and Orthodox do forehead, center of the chest, right shoulder, left shoulder. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and so we hand over our heart. Does it matter? Who no. Who cares? Um, does it really matter if you do it? Um, no. I mean, you're baptized either way, right? Um, I think it's a nice reminder of of that. Um, and I think it, it can be an appropriate gesture at the right time and the right place to do it. Um, you know, again, if we're treating it kind of like in a superstitious manner or something like that, then maybe not. Which direction you go, you know, you want to go the right, the right way, you know, <laughs> those Catholics are wrong, right? And over your heart. That's the older practice at some point that I don't remember when. It was very early on the West... Western Christianity started to flopped it around, and then Lutheranism turned went back. <laughs> Who cares? I flopped it around just because yeah. I never know. My you never right know which way to go. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and there's different ways. Um, there's different ways of doing it. I usually teach at this the school. The kids usually when you cross yourself, kind of the traditional way is you use three <clears throat> fingers, thumb and two. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right. So in the name of the Father. So three, name the Father, and then in the Son, the Holy Spirit. So, um, and then I'll hold my hands a certain way when I do it over in different, there's actually different gestures that are symbols of blessing. So my favorite is this one. You guys see that? Are you sure it's not a gay symbol? Yeah, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> no, that's the letters of Christ in Greek with my fingers. Yeah. Oh. Um, or a more common way is like two fingers, right? Or maybe a whole hand, so two fingers. There's a big division in the Russian church over when you make the sign of the cross, do you do it this way or do you do it this way, right? And it's, this is the difference, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
and then the two natures of Jesus, right? He's fully man, fully God. Or Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the two natures of Christ. <laughs> the church split in Russia, split about 300 <laughs> years ago. And that was one of the main issues. Is how many fingers? One? Seriously. Yeah. Between the, now the Russian Orthodox and what's called the Old Believers. And that was one of... There was like a list of six things, and that was like number two or three. They didn't have anything better to argue. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> okay. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, if you want to go back to 248 here, um, we, um, I'm not going to, um, we're not going to do the song, but I just kind of want to show you this, and then we'll do... Um, just the closing prayer. Um, but you have the Magnificat. So this is a, a version of a Vesper service is what it is. So an evening service, right? Um, the Magnificat is almost always sung during Vespers um, or an evening service. That's a very, very old tradition. The Magnificat is Mary's song when she hears that she's going to give birth to Jesus, right? Um, then you have a litany, which is just a list of prayers. This is a really cool one that we're going to do in the church service. Um, I think it is, where there's overlap. We did this one, this service on, um, if anybody went to the St. Michael and All Angels Day, yeah, this is the service nice. we use. So there's overlap. So I say, or sing in peace, let us pray to the Lord. And when I say Lord, the congregation starts, Lord, have mercy. So there's like this overlap. Um, so I like that I just think I think it sounds kind of cool it did yeah so what I want to do then is just um, where you have the collect for peace on page 251 that's where I want to start so I'll say that prayer then we can say the Lord's prayer together and then the benedicamus and the benediction is what we'll do okay so um <coughs> Um, so uh, I'll start with the call it to peace on page 251. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us your servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God, God, the Almighty and Merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bless and preserve you. Amen. Amen. All right.